lightning raid down the left there by Bournemouth with Tay very nearly uh, scoring a spectacular goal to put Bournemouth ahead. But still 1-1. Ross, tenacity alone won in that one. Allen, almost knocked Machin's head off with it, and lucky perhaps after that to get a second go. But he's now with Doherty. Allen again, and Doherty had gone the other way. And Powell, no problems. Now with five minutes to go. Oh, Nelms missing his chance, and Cave! Oh, and he hit the post! McDougal going in! Will he get a chance? I think it's gone too far. Well, that was a tremendous shot by Cave, beyond the reach of Pretty all the way. And against the post. So, Bournemouth, when he looked for a moment, too, as though Ted McDougal might be able to... Uh, Capitalise on the rebound. Get no more than a corner. Harry Redknapp taking it. Crossed again. And Peter Gelson there with no mistakes at all. How going in. Mitchinson. And Brentford certainly fighting. And there's a good ball from Doherty. But Miller there for Bournemouth. And Redknapp is well offside. Now it really is just a matter of seconds to the end of this third division game. But started brightly and fell away a bit towards the end, leaving this final score 1-1. The goals coming from John Doherty, first of all for Brentford, and then Ted McDougall, the equaliser for Bournemouth. So the full-time score here at Griffin Park is Brentford 1, Bournemouth 1. So a game that began so well, and indeed was a credit to the third division, rather fell away towards the end. But what about Ted McDougall? One fine goal to his credit, but not really in his best form. And I asked him afterwards if all the transfer talk had tended just to make him a little restless. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you've always got that nagging, nagging feeling in the back of your mind that you like this right here. You know, the first division I'm talking about. You know, it, it, it's always in the back of your mind, and you know. People say I'm not ambitious because I, I've, I've stopped at Bournemouth, but I'm as ambitious as the next next guy, like you know. And um, I, you know, if the chance comes, well, you know, I, you know, I'll just try and do my best anyway, you know. But as it's going at Bournemouth, you know, I'll see what happens, you know. But you would like, obviously, before you finish your playing career, to try the first division. Yes, um, I, I made a decision at 19 when I had two years to go of my apprenticeship as a line type operator, and people said finish your apprenticeship and I said no I want to be a professional footballer and I tried it and it could have gone bump and it's the same decision now you know I could get to 40 odd 50 your age and, and uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> and uh, you know I, I probably regretted the rest of my life maybe you know we've spoken about this before haven't we we've always yeah. said that while yeah. while you're banging in goals people yeah. will always want you yeah you, and that's what makes you depressed when you're not banging them well obviously see today I mean I never played well but I scored and I mean that, that just means everything to me it's no good to me playing well. I've probably played maybe three, three, four matches where I've play, probably played better than I've ever played for this club and not scored. And I go home and I just don't get the same satisfaction at all. You know, it, it doesn't mean a thing to me, really. And now manager John Bond. I said that we'd read that he's prepared to sell McDougall for the right fee and yet sometimes that he's not for sale. It all seemed a little confusing. It's confusion in my mind at the moment, Brian, for the simple reason that I keep seeing conflicting stories in the press. I haven't made any statement whatsoever. All I've ever said is um, that I would like to keep Ted McDougall here as long as I possibly could. But I realise as well as anybody that he's terribly ambitious. He wants to try his hand in the first division and it may be that the time is drawing nearer when I may have to consider letting him go to a first division club um, to see if he's able to do his stuff up the top there. You know, that everybody, everybody's ambitious and Ted is no exception. The difficult question, I know for you to answer, but how near is this crunch decision coming? 
that's, that's a, such a difficult question. I couldn't. It could be sooner than later, really, Brian. That's as easy as I could make it for you, really. Uh, sooner than later, yeah. the Ted moves. What's yeah, the first division? Well, I think so. Was you know, I mean, we've. I've had two good years with him, really. I've, I've, when I first came here, I was prepared to let him go after a couple of months. His ability to take stuff in is, is as good as any footballer within the country, and he's and he's made such progress during the last two years that I really feel now that um, the time is near when he's made as much progress as he can make whilst Bournemouth are a third division club. If we, for instance, had got into the second division last year, I think probably um, that the position would have been that much easier for us and for Ted. He talks about being restless and a bit depressed. You, you've obviously uh, are well aware of this. Yeah, well, I, I remember some time ago talking to you at our football ground and I said at the time that Ted McDougal was terribly self-centred when he got round about the penalty box. He's still this way, and, and why I say that is because he gets frustrated and upset with not scoring goals, Brian, and, and uh, it's partly to do with the, the unrest with him at this moment. But there's other things, you know, when he looks at you on um, Saturday lunchtimes on the box and he sees you interviewing these players and he sees all these big first division grounds, it makes his eyes boggle and he thinks, I'd like to sample that. John, you were a defender in the first division. How would that fellow make it in the first division? I said uh, yesterday to somebody that I'm absolutely certain in my mind, because I know basically what I'm looking at, I know basically what he can do and what he can take in the, and, and his knowledge of the game, that within nine months he will be the leading striker in the first division. Really? I, I'm, I'm as certain as that. You know, if, I, if I'd have moved to uh, a first division myself and I had a couple of opportunities, if I'd have moved, he would have come with me because he'll always come with me anywhere I go. Um, unfortunately, I'm staying at Bournemouth. Unfortunately, that is for Ted. Yeah. Um, but I would have taken him, and I, I would have bet anybody as much money as they like that he would, he would repeatedly score between 20 and 30 goals a season. And what sort of money do you ask for a player like that? I really haven't asked any money at all. I let people... But you must have got a figure at the back of your mind well, somewhere, John. Well, all right, I, I, I have. I, I wouldn't let him go under £200,000. Well, in spite of all that money, John Bond also told me that five First Division clubs had made a positive inquiry for McDougall in the last year. Well, Jimmy Hill watched McDougall yesterday in action with some of their representatives. Yeah, well, in fact, I sat there watching the match with uh, three Crystal Palace directors and uh, Eddie Bailey of Spurs and Bill Dodgin, who was scouting for West Ham. Uh, not an easy job for them to make up their minds. I tried to put myself in the position of a scout yesterday and see what I would think about paying £200,000 for Ted McDou McDougall. In fact, I had an advantage, and we've got that advantage now, because we had a camera locked off on his performance for the whole of the game. We really wanted to find out what made this man tick. And in fact, he, he caused a quick impression in the game very early on, soon after the start. He goes to lay a ball back here and recovers so quickly and shows all the ability that he's got to steam for goal and hammer in shots in the penalty area. That was right after the start of the game. There's a friend advising him how he might even have got it in the net if he'd carry on. He's there, he heads the ball and wins it in the area. But I want you to watch also the determination. He comes steaming in here at the end, and in fact he came in so fast there that he got ahead of the ball. People might say that was a mischance, but it was his determination that got him in there too soon. Watch how he slips Peter Gelson here, but in fact he runs into an offside position, heads quite accurately and coolly, just missing the goal. He wants the ball in the penalty area. He gets annoyed if it doesn't come as often as he would like, because it's there that he can make himself look a £200,000 player. Look here when the ball doesn't come over, how angry he gets that it hasn't been put into the penalty area. In the air, in the area he's useful, in the middle of the field he doesn't win it that often. But this is where I think the scouts might have forted him. You see here, he tries a dummy. Gelson's coming in, going for the ball, and he loses possession. Having made a good run, the move breaks down on him. Maybe it wasn't the moment to try a dummy, but we see another example here. When he's close marked, of where he has good skill, he takes this ball down on his chest, but he allows his opponent to get his foot in. In other words, he doesn't screen when he's close marked, and once again, uh, the, the move has broken down on him, though Gerson did play him very well in the course of this match. Now you see him in space, and you see that when he's clear of an opponent, he has the ability to control the ball neatly and lay it off. But mainly, of course, a man of this calibre, a goal scorer extraordinary, has the knack of being there. Just watch, when the ball hits the post from that shot, who's there when it bounces off? 
Ted McDougall, showing that he's quick and nippy for a man of his size. And finally, of course, the goal. Almost as if it were done for our benefit, there's the first header, accurately placed, but not quite accurate enough, and then the turn and the superb volley, which makes one wonder if a man can score goals like that in the third division, can he do it in the first? And of course, that's really the question that everyone is asking themselves. There's going to be a lot of discussion going on in boardrooms and in houses over the next few days among the clubs who are interested to say, can he do it when he gets in the first division? Because really with a player, it's not what you see where he is, it's what you can make of him, as Bill Shankly said to me only a couple of weeks ago, when you get him back home. I don't think it'll be quite £200,000. I do think he'll go quite quickly, but I think it'll be knocking on that. If you ask me, would I buy him if I were a manager? Well, uh, depends how much my knees were knocking at the time, how near the bottom of the league I was, or how near the top I thought I ought to get. I'm not going to give a direct answer. Why should I? The other people have paid for it. Let them have a stab. But more than that, what about Brentford? I was encouraged by Brentford's performance. I think they're fitting happily into the third division. Uh, they were unlucky losing Stuart Houston it, with an injury so soon after they'd transferred O'Mara. But nevertheless, they've got an all-round spirit and fire. I think they're a credit to their manager, Frank Blunston. It was an enterprising third division game, maybe a little too rough in parts. But nevertheless, I think uh, Brentford fit happily into the third division. Well, one last word on Ted McDougall. The big match for you, at any rate, is that we have a strong hunch that McDougall could well be on the move to the first division now and within a matter of days, we shall see.